As we continue this module, we're going to be looking at Mollier diagrams. So again, a Mollier diagram typically is going to be either PH or HS diagrams. Specifically, a Mollier diagram is going to be anything that includes H as one of the two axes. The first HS diagram was created in 1904 by a gentleman named Richard Mollier. Um, these were found to be incredibly helpful to people, and so people sort of started adopting it, and in 1923 they decreed that any diagram that had H as an axis would be named a Mollier diagram. We're going to look at two of these for pure substances, but you probably have in other courses, and certainly will in future courses, look at psychrometric charts or humidification charts, in which case you also have humidity as an axis, and those are going to also be called Mollier diagrams. These were, for anyone, you know, older, you would purchase as one of your engineering supplies a steam table. This was almost as important as your slide rule back in the day. These days, you know, what would we do without our calculators or our computers? But this was an essential tool for any engineer. And, you know, inside there would be lots and lots of tables that you could read numbers off, and there would be these graphs. And you can see here that this would fold out and open up to something really huge because people would literally read their data off of these graphs. And you see how detailed it is, and you see how large this is. So historically, this is the way that people found thermodynamic data. So why, in particular, say a pH diagram? Okay, Pressure and enthalpy is particularly useful when you're looking at refrigeration cycles. If you'll recall, a refrigeration cycle is going to have that compression stage, which is going to be isentropic, so it sounds like S would be an awesome tool to use there. And then it has condensing and evaporating of fluids at constant pressures. But then the key to getting a refrigeration cycle to work was the expansion valve. And because of the first law, no work, no heat transfer, no kinetic energy, no potential energy change, it ended up that these were isenthalpic processes. And so therefore, this was something that could be plotted as a constant H, and then the two isobars, constant P, and so a typical refrigeration cycle, the graph looks very much like this, where the only thing that keeps it from being a nice little rectangle is this line over here, might be straight, might be curved, but this is the only complication. So vapor compression refrigeration is very nicely done on a pH diagram. So again, let's look at what some of these might look like. So this is a typical pressure enthalpy diagram. This one is for nitrogen. And you will notice that the scale on the pressure is going to be logarithmic. So this is a semi-log plot. One graph is rectangular grid. One uh, axis is going to be a logarithmic grid. And the reason for that is to just shrink it down so that it's on a scale that fits better on a piece of paper. But we have all sorts of different lines here. We have constant volume lines, constant entropy lines. We have some constant temperature lines somewhere in here. Okay, lots of action going on here. But this is the way that people used to read thermodynamic data. Here's another one for methane. And you should start noticing that these graphs all sort of look a lot alike for different substances. That's going to be very important when we get to our next unit. Here's another one. This one is for oxygen. It's much cleaner. All they've shown you here are the isotherms. So again, looking at what the typical features are. We have pressure typically as a log on one axis, enthalpy as the other axis. We have a region where we have the two phases. We have liquid to the one side, vapor to the other side, and then we have different curves. So an isotherm for superheated gas is going to typically start 
go straight across at constant pressure during the two-phase region and then drop. We have lines with constant volume. We have lines with constant entropy. There can be many, many different lines. Any of these thermodynamic properties could be graphed. And again, if you wanted to know what the slope is of each of these lines so that you can take one known point and predict the next, then you're going to use, well, it's pressure versus enthalpy, so dPdH, at constant entropy, at constant volume at constant temperature. Now I said the other very common type is an enthalpy versus entropy diagram. The Rankine cycle is one that comes to mind here. Remember that we have constant entropy processes here. Now we don't have constant enthalpy processes, but enthalpy is the variable that we are most concerned with calculating during a Rankine cycle, because that's going to be the one that tells us how much work do I have, how much heat transfer is there. So a diagram for a typical Rankine cycle, where I just go from saturated vapor to saturated liquid in my uh, condenser, is going to look something vaguely like this. For steam, this is a typical HS diagram, and this would be the way that most commonly your grandfather, say, would have looked up data to do his test when he was in an engineering school. Here's a simpler version for steam so that you can kind of get a little bit better sense of what these lines are, and you can see how you find, say, a constant temperature, and read straight across for enthalpy, read straight down for entropy, okay? And any other line that intersects this would tell you, say, the pressure or whatever other variables you're interested in. Again, a typical graph is going to look something like this. Uh, when you have constant pressure is an easy one. I'm going to ask you in your homework to prove that dH dS at constant pressure is equal to temperature. That's an easy proof. Um, but that's going to be the slope of this line here. These are going to be lines of constant temperature. Okay, look like this. And we are able to find all of these things as how enthalpy changes versus entropy, so dH dS, at constant whatever variable I wish to hold constant.